It's an interesting topic, isn't it, a, a floating accent? I know that, um, sorry if I mentioned this, Shane, but Shane said to me at the beginning of the class, he said, oh, is that in the Bible? I'm sorry, but he was reading it, and it is in the Bible. Uh, and there's from amazing stories, principles, lessons that are associated with it. Only seven short verses, so maybe tonight uh, we'll have an early mark because we were late my last Bible class, so I apologise for that, but we'll make up for it tonight and maybe make it a bit shorter. So you can go home and actually mark your Bibles up. <laughs> well, okay, whatever. Okay, let's have a look at what this is all about. Okay, so let's just have a look at verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. So for those who haven't heard these studies before, the, the sons of the prophets were like a, a, a school of prophets and Elisha was their teacher. And here they were in this place where they said it was too straight for them. That, that means that, and you can see in the bottom of the screen, there, it means a narrow or a cramped place. I mean, that's not a Christadelphian gathering there. I've just Googled that and put that there. You know, a very small meeting hall, very tight and packed. And, and they were saying, look, it's, it's too... It's too tight for us. It's, we don't have enough room. Now, it doesn't mean that they were unhappy with their conditions, but they said, look, we really need to do something about it. And so um, whatever the reason was, it must have been one, not one of carnal ambitions. They weren't wanting something bigger and better. Uh, they were just being practical about it because Elisha, in verse 2, gives his consent. We read in verse 2, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there, where we may dwell, and he answered, go ye. So Elisha gives his consent, he says, yes, I agree, that's a good idea. Now, just perhaps a little bit of a diversion. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, I put this up probably about 10 years ago, some of you probably weren't even more if you're listening to 10-year-olds out there, 10 years ago. This, in fact, was the first meeting place of the Forest Oak Ecclesia, which became the Elwood Ecclesia in England. I actually met under that big oak tree. So... You know, we think we've got air conditioning. Actually, I'm a bit warm up here tonight. Is the air conditioning on? <laughs> I haven't got there. I haven't got there. I'm meeting under an oak tree and I'm complaining about the air conditioning. Okay. But there they are. They're all, all dressed up and uh, they come uh, in the correct attitude of mind and they met under this tree, this uh, very early ecclesia in England. In, in fact, that's now the Elwood Ecclesia there. Still quite a, a small meeting place uh, and that's inside. It's, it's quite, you know, tight and cosy and you can see a couple of people there that you might recognise, some of us might recognise, for example. Now, I don't know, the Griffiths might recognise some others because they're from that part of the world. But, uh, uh, so, can you see Ken and Trishy uh, Smith there? So, uh, that was a little ecclesia that they met in, and, and that was quite tight for a big person like me getting in and out of the chairs and the passageways there. Uh, so, you know, but they, I, I believe they still meet there. Okay, but let's, let's put things in perspective, though. So, you know, sometimes we complain about our life. If you have three meals a day and you do not go to bed hungry, you are in the 25% of the most blessed people in the world today. Just think about that. Only 25% of the world population gets three meals a day. If you've got some money in the bank and some loose change in your pocket, you're amongst the 8% of the most blessed people in the world. Now, I don't have any money. I don't carry silver, but I do have... Uh, my wife's got some money in the bank. So... <laughs> So I borrow it off her. But we are all blessed. But we're, we're in that 8% of the, of the population of the world. So, uh, and in, you know, in addition to this, God has given us the great things of the truth. Over 3 billion people, population of the world, anybody know what the population of the world is? 7 billion, that's right, 7 billion. 3 billion people of the world live on less than $2 a day. Now, young people, some of you probably get some pocket money, you might get $2 a week. I used to get pocket money. Uh, I used to get, here it comes, 20 cents a week. That's when I went to high school. Primary school, I didn't get anything. But, uh, yeah, so if you get more than 20 cents a week, you, you, you're doing better than I am. But here, look, over 3 billion people live on less than $2 a day. If a jumbo jet crashed every day for 365 days of the year, There'd be a public outcry, we've got to ground these things. People would say, look, we have to stop this. And yet 
That is the equivalent number of children that die every day throughout the world through malnutrition. Now, we are sitting here in an air-conditioned hall and God has blessed us and, and we're not finding things too difficult. It's very comfortable and God has called us and blessed us with the knowledge of the truth. But here were these people. They were saying, well, look, the place is too straight for us. And it doesn't mean that they were really complaining. They were just wanting to build something a bit better. And so they said in verse 2, look, let us go down to Jordan and there get a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And Elisha said, go, go, that's fine. Now, building in Israel at the time, in most of the, the ancient times in Israel, buildings were made of sandstone, which was a soft stone, which could be cut and shaped. Sun-dried bricks, which were made out of mud and straw, and you put them in this little, uh, just picked up the mud and straw, and you put them in a little uh, framework, and put them out in the sun and dried them. Beams or logs would have been used for the doorposts and the, and the lintels across the top of the doorposts. And the roofs were made of these, these beams and logs too, and they had uh, stamped and rolled earth upon the top. Now, I don't know how that made them waterproof, but that's what the Bible Encyclopedia tells me. So, you know, fairly simple building, but most of the building material was a sycamore tree. Now, does anybody know what a sycamore tree really is? What type of a tree it is? It's a fig tree. Sycamore tree is a, a type of a fig tree. Now, a fig tree is the symbol of Israel. We know that. We know that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. But some of the, these particular types of fig trees in Israel grew very, very large, you know, 20 metres high, uh, 15 metres high, very high, and, and very big girth, as you can see on the screen there. You see, this building work of these people here types the work of the carpenter of, Gal of Galilee, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from Mark and, and the, the Gospel records that the Lord Jesus Christ was a carpenter. So that means the Lord Jesus Christ worked hard, worked physically hard, but he also owns a great satisfaction in manufacturing things, in making things. So I say to the young men and to the young sisters and to the young boys and the young girls, you know, your life, you need, the girls need to be making things, doing things, being creative. Man has been designed to do that and, and the boys need to be making things and doing things and being creative with their hands and their minds, there is a great satisfaction. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ did that. He also worked very hard physically, shaping that sandstone, putting them in place, getting the, cutting the trees, shaping the trees, and, and uh, building everything with them. But there's a passage there in Zechariah that also talks about carpenters. Let's have a look at this passage in Zechariah chapter 1. Okay, just the second last book of the Old Testament. Here in Zechariah chapter 1, we actually have a prophecy in the early part of Zechariah of the nation of Israel in the last days and how there would be great conflicts in the land of Israel. But then in verse 19, we read these words. Well, verse 18, Then lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So now you've, in this prophecy, it's talking about four horns. In the Bible, horns represent powers. What four powers scattered Israel? Just think of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Babylonians, Medo-Persians, Grecians and Romans. These are the four horns, these four powers. He saw these four powers which scattered Judah, Israel and Jerusalem. And then in verse 20, the Lord showed me four carpenters. Now these four carpenters really are a symbol of the saints. That's us. We're not literally going to be carpenters, but we're going to be constructing, we're going to do this work. Then said I, what come these to do? What are the carpenters coming to do? And he spake, saying, these are, the, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, those four powers, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them. That means to, to put them to an end, to destroy them. The four now look, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian and the Grecian and the Roman power don't exist today. This is a latter-day prophecy. So it's talking about the, the, the power 
that, that actually exists on their territories. And that's one of the important understandings of Nebuchadnezzar's image, that when the image stands up on its feet, all of these territories that those powers occupied will become part of the image and it will be the work and we know that the stone is cut out of the mountain without hands and it strikes the image but here's another little part of it it's saying that these four carpenters that's us we will destroy those powers but you see it's not just a destructive work they are come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter them but you see it's saying that the, our work will be not just to destroy them but to rebuild that's the important part we need to understand our great work in the kingdom age isn't to destroy nations, and that's part of the work. It's to rebuild them, and of course that's a great principle in ecclesial life, that we're not here to destroy, we're here to build up, rebuild. We're, we're part of those four, the four carpenters represent, uh, represented by the four cherubim, the power of God. So just a little diversion. That's what these men were typing. They were typing the great work, these men and women, of that. Let's, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 6. Second, sorry, Second Kings chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 3. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. The word content means, look, yield. They're speaking these words to Elisha. They're saying, look, Elisha, we want you to yield to our request. We want you to go with us. And so Elisha agreed. And he says, I will go. Now here he is, he's a teacher in the school of the prophets. But you see, he's prepared to get down in the ecclesia and get his hands dirty. He's not the sort of Bible uh, student that just stands up on the platform all the time and just tells everybody what to do. He gets down there, he works amongst them, works with them, really important. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He was tried and tempted in all points like as we are without sin. And so he, Elisha was doing the same and we need to do the same. We need to get our hands dirty and get down and do all the necessary work that's done in an ecclesial life. So Elisha was prepared to do that. He wasn't a proud prophet. Of course he wouldn't be. He's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 4. So he went with them and they came to Jordan and they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. Notice in the, in the margin of my Bible for axe head, it's got iron. So it was an axe head made of iron. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. The word borrowed means to request to ask a loan. So that means they borrowed it off somebody. Now, it just gives us an idea of how poor the, the sons of the prophets were that they had to go and borrow an axe head made of iron. Also follows that it was somebody kind enough to loan the axe head. You know, so there's not only borrowing, there's somebody who's prepared to loan it. Let's have a look at this passage in Deuteronomy 15 and verse 17. Verse 7, Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren with any, with any of thy gates in thy land, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine hand, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shall surely lend him, lend him, sufficient for his need in that which he wanted. You know, just before I came out tonight, and some of you might have seen this already, there has been an email go around from the ACBM uh, for the, the terrible destruction that's occurred in Vanuatu. Uh, a request to help the brethren that have just lost all their homes and lost everything. And, and you know, here's, here's the Bible passage telling us what our response needs to be. We've got poor brethren in that country now. We're not just going to loan them. So not. I'll explain what this word lend means a little bit more, a little bit later. But let's hope that we can in some way 
give something to help those poor brethren, not to shut up our hand from our poor brother. Verse 8. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and thou shalt lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto Yahweh against thee, and it be a sin unto thee. You see, in Israel, and we've just actually read this in our readings in Deuteronomy 25, that as you got to the end of the seventh year, people would be released from their obligation. They wouldn't have to repay their loan. And so here it's saying if it's just a year away and this brother might be, who's loaned the money would think, well, I've only got a year to go and if he doesn't pay me back in that year, I've got to release him from that obligation. I don't like that. I want to get it back. You know, God's saying, you do that, then you've got an evil eye. Evil eye means you can only... Yeah, niggly, you're very mean. That's what it means. You're mean. You're not Christ-like. You know, we loan to people, and we don't expect to receive again. Sometimes, I have to expand on that. Verse six, verse ten: Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest this unto him, because that for this thing Yahweh thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor. That's true. The poor shall never cease out of the land. Now look, our brothers and sisters in Vanuatu and in other places are very poor. You know, we're living in affluent Australia, but there are always poor brethren and sisters. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to the poor and to the needy in thy land. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a scriptural injunction. It's, it's in the Old Testament, yes. But the principle is still there. And so here the scriptures were saying he was somebody who was prepared to loan an axe head to do something that the ecclesial hall might be built. Now when we come back to Second Kings 6, the word lend, or the word lend in, in Deuteronomy, means to give a pledge for anything borrowed. So if I loaned you something, you might have to give me something back in return. That's what it means. You don't necessarily expect that, but that's what the word means. Normally, the borrower would have given a pledge, which might have simply been, I promised to give the axe back. And now that it was lost, seemingly forever, he was in debt because his axe head was lost. Now let's have a look at this Psalm 37.21. Psalm 37.21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. So now here I'm, I'm the borrower. I borrowed something from somebody, but I don't pay it back. Now I must say, and, and brethren out there, I've, I've got any of your books and I haven't given them back. Please come and tell me straight away. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I go into my bookshelf to get a book and, oh, where is it? What I do these days, because I loan books to people, what I do these days, I actually put it on my Outlook and my computer, so every day it pops up and it says, Greg Hagen, oh, sorry, not Greg, but <laughs> it says, Greg Hagen's got this book and I loan it to him such and such a day. Be because we tend to forget these things, you know. It, but the scriptures are saying that if we borrow something, we need to repay it. We need to give it back. And, and sometimes, as Christadelphians, we, we tend to, you know, we just forget about it. But the scriptures are saying, look, we've got a responsibility. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. You know, it reminds me of a little, uh, you know, the type of story where this is not necessarily borrowing, but, you know, we hire a four-wheel drive vehicle for the weekend and we're going to go out in all the mud and all the sand and take it to Fraser Island. And we, if we take the attitude, well, look, it's not my vehicle, I'm going to bash it about, I'm going to drive it through the ocean and bring it back all that's not the attitude of a Christadelphian. If somebody loan, and I'm talking about a hired vehicle, but if we borrow something or, or we hire something from somebody as brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got a responsibility to look after it as if though it were our own, 
and return it. Now that's how this man felt. He felt terrible. Another quotation there, Proverbs 19, 17. Proverbs 19, 17. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto Yahweh. Now you wouldn't think that, would you? If, if you were loaning something to a brother and sister, but you're actually giving it to God. And that which he hath given, will he pay him again? Now I'll just read you Rotherham's translation. A lender to Yahweh is one who showeth favour to the poor, and the good deed he will pay him back. So what the scriptures are saying, you help the poor, God will pay you back in some way. Now, we, we're not to help poor brothers and sisters just to get paid back, but God says, I will do that. So we are to have pity upon the poor and we are to lend. If God's given us something, we're to return that back to God in service to others. First Samuel 1, and uh, we, we know this story. Uh, it's the story of uh, Samuel. First Samuel 1. And verse 27. So, you know, we know the story. Hannah prayed for a child. She was barren. Eventually, Yahweh blessed her, and she was blessed with the young child Samuel, which means heard of God. God heard her prayer. And now she brings the child that she wanted so much for herself. Her, the other wife of... of, of um, Elkanah had plenty of children but Hannah had none and she felt this very very much but she was going to give this little boy back to God verse 26 and she said O my Lord talking to Eli as thy soul liveth my Lord I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto Yahweh for this child I prayed and Yahweh hath given me my petition which I asked of him the word petition, and I think I've got it on the next screen, there it is there, which means to ask a loan. It's the same word as borrowed in First Kings about the axe head. Yahweh has given me my loan, which I asked him of. Therefore also I have lent him to Yahweh. As long as he liveth, he, he be lent to Yahweh, and he worship Yahweh there. Now I must say, brethren and sisters, and, and mothers and fathers with young children, God has blessed you with children. God has not given you those children to pamper, to spoil, to give things that you miss out in your life and to fill up their lives with all sorts of things. God has given you those children. And Gail and I have always taken this attitude, even with our children, it doesn't always work out, but we have always had this attitude. Yahweh has given us those children and he's given you those children that those children might be returned again to him in service they've been loaned to us they're not ours they are the seed that belong and this woman recognised that and we need to recognise that in ecclesial life as mothers and fathers the children that Yahweh has given us really belong to him he's loaned them to us and we need at some time to return them to him and so we ask for blessings in this life for whatever reason. It must be we return, whatever the blessings are, we return them to Yahweh. You know, our homes, do we offer our homes, open up our homes for the service of the truth, the brothers and sisters? Our cars, do we, don't, do we just keep them for ourselves or do we use them to help in some way in the truth? Everything we've got, Yahweh has given us and we need to return those things in the service of the truth. Christ gave his life for the ecclesia and we're the beneficiaries of that giving. See, we live in an age, brethren and sisters, of selfishness. People are selfish. You know, they want everything for themselves. What's in it for me? But the brother and sister of Christ is a person who opens themselves up and gives themselves. Christ, that's the principle of Christ's life. He gave his life that we might have life. So we need to open ourselves up 
and give in the service of the truth. Now here's a passage, a very interesting passage in Exodus 12. You know, most of the things, all the things we've been given in this life do not belong to us. Exodus 12. Now here you've got the children of Israel exiting out of the land of, of, uh, of Egypt. They've come out and just before they go, verse 34, the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs, Exodus 12 verse 34, their kneading troughs that they're making all the bread on, being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses and they borrowed, here's the same word, they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. Now, do you think, brothers and sisters, do you think, young people, that all these things they borrowed from the Egyptians, that when they got back out in the wilderness, they said, oh, this doesn't belong to us, we've got to return it back to Egypt. They didn't. I mean, what was this stuff? This, this stuff, this, this, these riches were used for the building of the tabernacle, the gold and the silver. Yeah, what's it really being said? It says the Egyptians loaned it to them, but the Egyptians didn't own it. It came from God. That's what it's saying. God gave it to the Egyptians. The Egyptians gave it to the Israelites. Now the Israelites had to give it back to God. Everything we've got, brethren and sisters, same principle, is borrowed. God has given it to us. Not that we heap it up and sit there and look, oh, this is wonderful, this is mine. No, we use that and we give of that that Yahweh has given us in the, we return it back to him in the service of the truth. Just little principles, but they're vital principles in ecclesial life. All right, let's go back. Let's get back to the miracle. What's it all about? Back to 1 Kings chapter 6. So, sorry, 2 second, second Kings chapter 6. <clears throat> the purpose of the miracle. Now, Israel is telling us that the nation of Israel had lost their axe head. They could no longer be a cutting instrument for God. Now, I want you to look at this passage in 1 Samuel 13. This is the message behind this incident. 1 Samuel 13. Now it says here in verse um, 19, now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Now that doesn't mean there was no, well, Wayne and Lois are not here, or Joel Smith, it doesn't mean Smith's surname. It means a blacksmith, somebody who makes cutting instruments. Blacksmith. Nobody to make cutting instruments found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords of spears. You see, what's happened here? The Philistines had so much power over Israel that they wouldn't let them make anything. It says, but all the Israelites went down to the every man his share, his cult and his axe and his mattock. So the Philistines made, because they didn't want them to overpower them, the Philistines. Yet they had a file for Maddox. Now that word file means a pim, is the word pim, or a tax. It's saying if the Israelites went down into the lands of Philistines, they had to pay a tax to get the instrument sharpened. And if these Philistines didn't want to sharpen it, they wouldn't. Yet they had a file for the Maddox and for the cultists and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son, there was found. So there's only two swords. The Philistines made sure of that. Now, that's what's being said here. Israel had lost their ability. They had no cutting instrument to cut down the timber of the nations and to build a house for God because the Philistines were stopping them from doing that. We can do the same, brethren and sisters and young people, we can lose that cut. Israel lost that cutting edge. Hard and bad times can come in our lives. For Israel, alas, it was 
sank down and was buried in the mud. That can happen to us, brothers and sisters. We can have some sort of incident in our life and all of a sudden we just lose it and we're like, oh no, I'm, I'm not interested in doing any more work. I'm not interested in fighting the Philistines. I'm just not going to cut down any wood and build Yahweh's house. If we lose the axe head, we are no longer able to make any progress in the building of the Lord's work. Now, how can you lose your axe head? Well, by neglecting personal prayer. By not coming to Bible classes. Not, coming, not doing personal study and reading. Maybe you're not doing things in the truth like you used to do. You know, and we all feel that. We think, oh, I've lost my edge a little bit. I need to sharpen myself up a little bit. Sharpen myself up a little bit. That's what happened to Israel and can happen to us. We can lose our cutting edge. But we serve a God who fixes things. Israel lost it. We lose it. Let's have a look in First King, Second Kings 6. And the man of God, verse 6, and the, that's Elisha, said, Well, where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and he cast him thither, and the iron did swim. So God, you know, through Elisha, fixed the problem. We've got a problem in our life. We lose our cutting edge. We go back to God in prayer. He will fix the problem, but we've got to do our part. That's what's being said here. We need to do our part. Now, Let's have a look in Romans 8.28. God can bring good out of evil. The axe head was lost, it was restored. Romans 8.28. And we know... Romans 8 verse 28 we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose so the passage is saying well you find in your life you've got very difficult circumstances you lose your axe head you lose your cutting edge you go back to God in prayer you work on it God can fix the problem doesn't just happen automatically as we see this man had to do something but God can fix the problem to them who are called according to his purpose now what does that mean well it means brethren and sisters and young people that when we come to the truth we're called the seven billion people out there in the world and there's probably not oh, what 70 people in this room how have we been called God has made his word available to us we can either reject it or accept it. That's what it means. We've been called through his word. Now, God chooses to call whom he will, but he's made his word available. But then in verse 29, he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he glorified. I just think that those passages need a little bit of a brief explanation. They are not saying that God has jumped inside of us in some way and said, well, all right, Neville Bullock, you have been predestined to get into the kingdom of God, and no matter what happens in your life, you're going to... It's not saying that. This passage is saying that God who knows... The beginning before the end. He knows what's going to happen. He knows who will be there. And he has a bride. He has a purpose. He has a body. He knows who these people will be. And so he has predestined the bride of Christ will be made up of these people. But these people along the way have free will. Very important point. Have free, we can either accept or reject. If, God, if we have the idea that, well, we're all locked into this and whatever we do, we're still going to get there, then what's the use of the judgment seat? What's the parable of the ten virgins all about? Why does it say that many are called and few are chosen? Why does it say that they will say, 
we, Lord, we have seen Abraham, Isaac, they, they, they will have seen, we will see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God and they will be cast out. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be those who will be rejected. So we are called, yes, but God requires a response from us. And we're not predestined. God has, in the sense that God has jumped inside of us and said, well, whatever happens, you can't fail. You can fail. We're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, as our brother Gary pointed out very clearly in his studies. But we just need to get that right balance that we can lose our faith. And that's what happened here. This man lost his axe head and he had to do something about getting... And God is the one that can fix the problem. That's what it's telling us. Let's come back to um, 2 Kings 6. I thought, this, I thought I was going to be finished by quarter past and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Sorry, David and Dennis. <laughs> 2 Kings 6. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him a place, and he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Now the word cut, the word cut there means to cut evenly, to shape or size evenly. It's, it's used in the Song of Solomon, no need to turn up the passage, where it talks about sheep all being evenly shorn. So it means a piece of timber that's cut nice and neat. Now it's different to the word cut in verse 4. So he went with them and when they came to Jordan they cut down wood. Different word. Here, to solve the problem, he cuts down a stick. Okay? And the stick was cast into the water and it made the iron swim. Well, what's that all mean? Well, Elijah was to go out. There would have been sticks everywhere. You know, they're, they're cutting down timber. The sticks everywhere. He had to go out and cut down a special stick. The word stick, H, is translated tree 160 times. So it would seem that Elisha cut down a young sapling and threw this into the water. Now, it's a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, the branch. And because of time, I won't turn up these passages, but you know these passages. Zechariah 3, Isaiah 11, verse 1. Behold, the man whose name is the branch, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. This branch that's cut down and evenly shaped is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ came to save that which was lost, didn't he? I mean, all of mankind was lost. And the Lord Jesus Christ was specially cut and shaped and he was thrown into the Jordan where the stick was thrown. You know, that's the place, the Jordan is a type of, it flows from Adam to death, to the Dead Sea. It's a type, the Lord Jesus Christ was thrown into death. He was the branch that was specially cut and trimmed that he might save that which was lost. And that's what it's saying. Now it says that the axe head the iron did swim so it swam over the word means actually that it means to float over to flow over so there's a picture of the man putting out his hand but the iron floated, floated over, swam over to his head see we serve a God who can retrieve the irretrievable you know in those days an axe had fallen into probably three metres of water and mud think, well it's lost forever but no God can retrieve that we may say the problem is too big in our life, there's no solution. God has got, we don't know what it is at the time. Uh, and that passage in Genesis 18 verse 14 is where Sarah says, you know, she laughed that she was going to have a child, but the angel said, is anything too hard for God? Nothing's too hard. Whatever the big issue in, in our life is, nothing is too hard for God. God can bring about a solution. We don't know what the solution is. God can, you know, the, the big overall solution is redemption in Christ, of course. But if we associate ourselves with Christ, he is able to work with us. And so the man reaches out, we're told. It, we're told he put out his hand, verse 7, and he took it. It's telling us we have to do something. We don't just sit there on our hands and say, oh, why was me? I've lost my axe head. Everything's gone wrong in my life. Well, God, will you fix it? We have to do something. We have to pray, we have to come to Bible classes, we have to read our Bible, we have to try and be Christ-like to our brethren and sisters. So we've got to get back to it. 
We've lost our cutting edge. We've got to do something about it. Now, all right, that's the lessons for us. But in relation now to the nation of Israel, what could this mean in relation to the nation of Israel? Well, you see, the axe represents Israel as God's battle axe. Only in the age to come will the battle axe of Israel be wielded to lop the trees of the nations. Then the house of Israel will no longer be in straits, but they will be able to build the house of God literally. Now Israel is the lost axe head. Great passage here in Jeremiah 51 verse 19. Jeremiah 51 verse 19. Now this passage is talking about the destruction of Babylon and Babylon the Great. Verse 19, Jeremiah 51, 19. The portion of Jacob is not like them, not like the Babylonians. For he, the portion of Jacob is a reference to the arm of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Yahweh of armies is his name. Thou art my battle axe. Quite clearly, God saying, Israel, you are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms, and with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider, and with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. With thee also will I break in pieces man and woman, and with thee will I break in pieces old and young, and with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid. Of course, it goes on to go on and talk about the destruction of Babylon the Great. Quite clearly, Israel is the battle axe. Let's have a look at this prophecy in Isaiah 10, verse 33 and 34. Still on the theme of Israel being God's battle axe. Isaiah 10, 33. Behold, the Lord, Yahweh of armies, shall lop the bow with, with terror. What do you lop a bow with? With an axe. And the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled. He shall cut down with the axe of Israel the thickets of the forest with iron. And that word iron is the word axe. Bartzel, it is axe. The forests, the nations... And Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. All the trees of the nations will be cut down. Then it merges and it flows on into chapter 11. Therefore, there shall come forth a rod out of this tree that's been cut down, this stem of Jesse and a branch the Lord Jesus Christ shall grow over his roots. So the, the nations will be cut down, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the branch, will come forth out of this tree. So quite clearly this passage here in 2 Kings referring to the Acts in relation to Israel speaks of Israel in the future aid as God's battle axe. Now today Israel has lost the ability to defend themselves. In the days of the judges, we won't turn these passages up because I'll get sacked if I go over time, they chose new gods and war was at the gates. Neither a shield nor a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. So even in the days of the judges, they didn't have a cutting instrument. In the days of Saul, we've looked at that passage in 1 Samuel 13. And in the days of the Babylonian captivity, it says they carried away all the craftsmen and the smiths. So they, you know, the Bible is saying time and time again, Israel has lost its cutting edge. It cannot produce a sharp instrument to cut the nations down and to build a house for God. It just can't happen. But we've seen those passages in the future. Israel will become the cutting edge again. That lost axe head is going to rise to the top of the water. It's going to come up out of the sea of nations. And it's going to float on the top. And it's going to be picked up by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's another reason for the miracle. This... This reason is going to project us back into the time of this passage here in, in 2 Kings 6, when they had all the Canaanite religions around them. Now, archaeologists have found that a Canaanite cult practice 
they practiced restoration of life again. And one of the symbols they used was to take an axe head, put it into water, and the axe head would float again. Now, this was found to be in the same time as approximately the same time as, as this uh, passage in Kings here. So the Canaanites were doing this practice. So they were suggesting, look, we've got the power. These, these priests of Baal were saying, we've got the power to, re as this, axe, this iron axe head comes up in the water, we've got the power to restore life again. Of course, it was all trickery. They just made an axe head out of timber, put it in the water. Of course, timber will eventually float to the top, depending on the density of the timber. So it was trickery, but it was counterfeit. Now, the word for axe in 2 Kings 6, as I mentioned, is the word Barzel. Now, discoveries have been found of one of these faces of Baal as Baal Barzel. So, in other words, they worship this god. There was an axe head. There's a picture of one. Its face supposedly like an axe head. They worship this god. And this miracle here was really to show also all those other lessons we've talked about but to show how counterfeit that religion of the Canaanites was, that God really could bring the iron to the surface of God. So God's power was more than adequate to expose and confound the myths and rituals of false cults by which the faithful few in Israel were surrounded. They were constantly advised to reject such things lest they should become polluted by them. So God was saying to them, look, all these gods around you will try and trick you. Don't be tricked. And here's a miracle that I will show you that shows that I am the true God and have power greater than them. And of course the lesson applies just as much for us today brethren and sisters and young people. There's all sorts of things out there in the world that will try and trick us and, and you know I've heard Christadelphians say well look I think that maybe that church is not too bad they're just like us they believe in you know Israel invading and uh, being you know, invading Israel so maybe they've got the truth. We're being tricked they are not like us. There is one faith, one hope, one body, and one Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the scriptures say. And we as Christadelphians believe that we have the truth today. No other religion has it today. And so Ero was frustrated by this miracle. The swimming of the axe head would evoke the same sort of anger and frustration in the minds of the priests of Baal as Moses' rod did when it swallowed up Janes and Jambres' serpents or as the raising of Lazarus did to the minds of those who opposed the Lord Jesus Christ, or as the, as the resurrection of Jesus did in the minds of those who, who wouldn't be convinced that one rose from the dead. This axe head was teaching that same principle. So now, brothers and sisters and young people, just to draw this all to a close, and we've seen this before, this slide, I just want to compare this as a type of all of those things that we have suggested. Brother Thomas says, Bible types is a mode of instruction more calculated to keep up the attention and to impress the mind permanently than a set course or a formal disposition. The scriptures are constructed after this ingenious plan by which they are made so much more interesting and capable of containing so much more matter than any other book of the same subject and the same size. So what I'm saying to you is what we've got here, yes, it teaches all those lessons, but it's a Bible type. And here is the Bible type of what is being pointed out or taught here. In relation to the nation of Israel, what does this all mean? Well, the sons of the prophets, they represent the national sons of Israel who laboured in times past to build the house of God. They said the place is too straight for us. And Israel had found that other nations had closed in on them and made things too straight for them and they couldn't continue to build. They said, let us make a place there. And faithful sons have laboured throughout the ages to build the house of God. This has not been a national work, but it's yet to come. The house of God has not really yet been fully constructed. The nations have restricted that. One said, let us go and build something. And that's the faithful people in the nation of Israel, the certain one, the one who lost the borrowed axe and, and laboured to build. They cut down Israel, they cut down wood. Well, Israel commenced to cut down the trees of the surrounding nations that Yahweh's habitation might be built. 
but the axe head fell into the water. Israel lost the ability to defend itself. It lost, that, it lost the ability to, to build and to cut down the nations and it sunk into the mud and the mires of the nations. Alas, for it was borrowed. The word borrow means to ask a loan and borrowing implies that it must be returned. And so Yahweh has loaned the riches of the world to Israel that they might glorify him, but they lost that trust. Israel borrowed from Egypt when Yahweh delivered them. They borrowed the materials that would be used in the construction of the tabernacle. In the age to come, Israel will loan to the nations. Let's just have a look at this passage in Deuteronomy 28. In the kingdom, Israel will loan to the nations of the world. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 12. Yahweh shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his seasons, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Israel has been borrowing but they will lend in the kingdom age. Verse 13, And Yahweh shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, you will float to the top of the sea of nations, and thou shalt not be beneath, you won't be down in the mud, if thou hearken unto the commandments of Yahweh thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. They will eventually be there. They will, that, those blessings of Deuteronomy 28 will eventually be brought to pass. And so we're told he cut down a stick and we saw that was the evenly cut rod. It's also a shepherd's crook. It's a measuring rod. The passage you want to turn to there in Ezekiel 20 and verse 37. Ezekiel 20, verse 37. This is talking about the return of Israel again when they will rise to the top of the nations. Verse 34, and I will bring you out from amongst the people, Ezekiel 20, 34, I will bring you out from amongst the peoples, as it should be, and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered. Now, I'll just make the point, brethren and sisters and young people, this verse has not been fulfilled. I mean, the, what we're seeing with, in the land of Israel today is only a partial return. This passage is talking about the great work of Elijah when they come back again. And I will bring you out from the, peace, the people and will bring you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. Now the wilderness of the people is the Catholic system that will oppose the return of the Jews. It's not the deserts of, of Arabia. The wilderness of the people are the nations of the world, Europe and Catholic the countries, that will Israel will have to fight their way through. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, says the Lord Yahweh. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. Here's the word, the stick, the rod. This time it's the shepherd's rod. I'll cause you to... It's a rod of guidance, but it's a rod of correction also. Israel, the nation of Israel, will be passed under that rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. That means they'll have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll have to be baptised. They'll have to accept salvation on the basis of grace offered through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, not on the basis of works. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me, I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and ye shall know that I am Yahweh. So the rebels will be purged out. So coming back now to our, our screen, the iron did swim. Well, it floated, it came to the surface. And so the shepherding of Israel under Elijah will cause Israel to rise to the top of, of the nations. He put out his hand to take the stick. It's the mighty hand of he who manifests the combined spirit of Elijah and Elisha, the Lord Jesus Christ, the outstretched arm of Yahweh which will bring salvation, and he took it. 
Israel will be brought into the bonds of the covenant as Yahweh takes them to himself again. Then the axe head will, will be reunited with the handle of the Lord Jesus Christ and the nations will be cut down. Oops, that's the end. Let's start with the next study. So there we have it, brothers and sisters and young people. You know, short little seven verses, but really packed with wonderful lessons. So as we leave tonight, as we go away, let's remember those principles. If we've lost our cutting edge, we can do something about it. We need to do something about it. We need to get back to our personal Bible study. We need to develop in the truth. And we need to put out our hand and do something. But Yahweh will be the one who can solve all of those problems that we are encountering in our lives. He will be the one who will solve the problem for the nation of Israel and Israel will become that battle axe again. But not as we've said for destruction, but as we said in the very beginning, those four carpenters which really represent us will be used to take the, the, the wood of the nations and to rebuild the nations that they might be a place that reflects Yahweh's glory.